Greetings, everyone. Welcome again to Shepherd's Voice magazine. We're so happy that you've welcomed us into your living room or to your kitchen or your car or wherever it is that you're watching or listening to this uh, broadcast. Uh, I want to thank Jim straight away for a couple of weeks ago as he gave a message that uh, served to help articulate uh, some of the stuff that I, I was talking about in the first uh, two messages that I've given on this topic, liberty and whole, love for all, uh, this being part three. Uh, it's always good sometimes to have uh, a fleshing out of what's being said here because sometimes we delve into topics that are not necessarily all that comfortable for us and certainly if we've had a long history in the Church of God. But understand these messages come in love and we, uh, we, we want these uh, messages to be a blessing to you. So God willing this one will be a blessing to you as well. Uh, we're going to jump back into Galatians 5. Uh, I will say at the outset here that uh, this message, a lot, the bulk of it, a lot of it, uh, was written prior to Jim uh, giving that message there a couple of weeks back. And that's fine. Some of this might uh, come off as a, a touch repetitious, but that's all right. We're, we're okay with repetition here on Shepherd's Voice. Um, I wanted to kind of bring this, uh, this topic, not uh, the topic in its entirety to a close, but this section of it at least uh, to a bit of a close here inside of these three messages now that uh, hopefully by the end of the day today we'll be, uh, we'll be through with. And uh, hopefully, God willing, you know, we do come away with things that are an enhancement to our overall belief and how we think and uh, literally Christian thought, you know, where, where we go with this stuff. Um, I've left the beginning of uh, the passage that we're going to read today, or this passage that we've been reading here in Galatians 5, I've left the beginning of it to the end. Um, because it kind of punctuates what we've been talking about and it really does utilize the terms liberty and love. And these are such important concepts when we're talking about our relationship with God, with Jesus Christ, and how it is that we relate to the law that we can read of in, in, in our Bibles. And where do we fall into that relationship? So, going forward, we really need to internalize the fact that the freedom and liberty that we're going to be talking about today and that we've been talking about, these things emanate from Christ's love. In fact, they are core elements of Christ's love. And... Brethren, we are given the ability to live fully within it. And as it typically goes with, with this sort of thing and with things that are a blessing to us, there's pitfalls to not fully embracing all that the grace of God has to offer in terms of our salvation. You know, uh, just jumping ahead with that. So there's an effect that it, it can have on us. And it does affect us. Certainly salvation is something that affects us. But further pitfalls are what it does to Jesus Christ when we reject the fullness of his grace. And the fullness of his sacrifice. Let me tell you what I think about this and what I mean by this. I think we need to think of it this way. Consider the suffering and the pain that Jesus endured to put us in this position of liberty and freedom that we thankfully enjoy. And if we're considering that, and think of what it might mean to him to have a gift of that enormity the sacrifice that he brought to bear, to have a gift of that enormity set aside for the trust in physical law, a covenant that he came to replace. And he did bring about a new covenant. And we've read reams about this 
lately, and we've spoken about this, that we are under a new covenant. You see, Jesus went to a place on the stake wherein he truly experienced the devastating moment when the presence of his Father couldn't be felt. Why have you forsaken me? I have a hard time even reading that one aloud. I get choked up when I read it. Because I think of the absolute moment of complete loneliness and singularity that he felt when his father had to turn his back on him. And he did so so that we would never uh, again have to realize that kind of abandonment. He did so so that going forward those who would believe on him and have faith in him would never be left alone like that. What a wonderful part of that new covenant. We need to keep these things in mind. See, it would appear, to me at least, that the negativity uh, of, of that would only be compounded if we were not able to get out of our own way, folks. And to put ourselves in a lonely and dangerous spot like that by choice or by our own doing, allowing ourselves to be put there. So with that, we're going to take some of these verses apart as we are want to do here. I'm going to start out by reading... The first five, six, six verses of Galatians 5. And we'll make a quick note here. I know I typically use the Christian Standard Bible, and I'm going to read from that as well. But for this, lo and behold, we're actually going to look at some New King James Version uh, language here because I think it actually articulates what Paul was talking about uh, in a little bit better fashion. So from the CSB, verse 1 of Galatians 5 says, For freedom, for freedom, Christ set us free. And we're going to retrace back to that for freedom thing here in just a sec. It says, Stand firm and don't submit again to a yoke of slavery. Now, throughout some study, you'll find that the Jews of the time, especially the priesthood, they referred to the law of Moses uh, in terms of a yoke. And they were talking about it positively. But what we're talking about here today, as Paul puts it in this uh, first verse, this yoke is of slavery. This is a negative yoke. It's a bad yoke. Sorry, I had to. But we can't get started here if we're thinking of this yoke in, in an incorrect manner. So he is talking about a negative here. He says, and don't submit again. So this means that he's talking to somebody or a group of people that were once held in bondage or slavery. All right, verse 2. Take note. I, Paul, am telling you that if you get yourself circumcised, Christ will not benefit you at all. Again, I testify to every man who gets himself circum circumcised that he is obligated to do the entire law. You who are trying to be justified by the law are alienated from Christ. You have fallen out of grace. For we eagerly, eagerly await through the Spirit, by faith, the hope of righteousness. Right there, that, that passage right there should, should tell us a lot. In verse 6, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision accomplishes anything. What matters is faith working through love. Now, let's draw a quick distinction here as we kind of pull out here. 
The King James Version starts with, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty, the liberty, by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. And then he puts his name behind it. Indeed, I, Paul. He's making a very serious statement here. This meant something to Paul, and he wanted to impart that to the Galatians. And further ahead, he's relating this to us. I only bring that out in the other translation because we're going to hit this idea of the liberty here momentarily because we're not talking about just any liberty. So let's go, go ahead here about verse 1. It says, for freedom. That is, that's in the, the Christian Standard Bible. It says, for freedom Christ set us free. So he's talking about, he's using freedom kind of as an omnibus term in this translation, and it's Jesus Christ purposing a particular liberty, this freedom that actually releases us from bondage. And as I said at the beginning here, it is Jesus who has made us and if Jesus has made us free, then ask yourself, who has the authority to make you unfree? If Christ is the ultimate authority. Hmm. So this means that if we try to enter into a legal relationship with God, it isn't because God wills it that way. We don't want a legal relationship with God. I've said it before in messages, if we got what we deserved from God, we probably wouldn't necessarily like it so much. So we have to be careful on what it is that we're looking for here. You see, because God not willing us to have a legal relationship with him well, that exemplifies bondage when we kind of run counter to that, doesn't it? See, God, as I noted, you know, when he sent Jesus Christ to bear the sacrifice, and bear the penalty, in sacrifice rather, that would naturally be on our shoulders, on our heads, well, we see that God has gone well out of his way to see us walk in freedom. Like we said, he doesn't will it that we would get caught up in the yoke of bondage, especially if it's a return trip. The Paul had said, you know, going back into bondage. bondage. That's because God pushes us forward. The whole message of Jesus Christ is one of moving forward. If you can hear my cat meowing in the background, that's all right. That's just Finn voicing his displeasure with the studio being set up in the living room and we're not letting him outside. It's very hot here while we're recording this. So let's take a closer look at what uh, Paul says here in verse 1. See, we, know, we noted the translational subtleties between the CSB and the New King James Version. Let's note how in the King James Version, or the New King James Version, how we read that Paul is using the term the liberty. The liberty. Let's not think of liberty as doing whatever we want. You know, sparing ourselves you know, no opportunity, pleasure, that kind of thing. It's not what it's talking about. It's not talking about not denying ourselves things. That's not what this, that's not the kind of liberty that, it, that he's talking about. Again, note, he says, the liberty. Very different. Not just any liberty. 
You see, the, the liberty that he's referring to is our freedom from having to earn our way to God. And he goes through quite a bit to explain how that just isn't going to work anyways, and we'll see what Peter had to say about that here in a moment as well. But not just earning our way to God, but it includes things like freedom from sin, guilt, condemnation. Again, freedom from the penalty that would have been ours. Freedom from death. It's ultimately talking about freedom from the penalty our sin brings. And standing fast implies that there's some work, you know, involved to stay in that place of liberty. And this is because, unfortunately, it is possible for an individual who has been, let's call it that, legally set free through the purchase of the blood of Jesus Christ to revert back into bondage. But in light of what we're told from Jesus Christ and what we're told about what Christ said through the likes of Paul and Peter and so forth, this can only happen through deception. Somebody has to deceive us, and typically from someone or something that doesn't want you to be set free. To them, there is no intrinsic value in your freedom because it doesn't benefit them. You see, usually someone who benefits from your enslavement will put up the greatest resistance. And I'll leave it up to you to fill in the blank that happens to apply to you if you feel that kind of influence has been brought to bear on you in your life. Sadly enough, though, it's usually motivated by money and or control. And that's the sad truth of it. And that can mean that, you know, one who stands to lose out financially, if you discover that you're not bound to them or their, let's say, their doctrinal thrust, well, they'll more than likely be quite willing to deceive you and make you think that you are or have to be tied to their way of thinking. And this is the kind of problem that Paul was driving at. Because then we can add fear and deception, and suddenly we have a recipe for full-on spiritual disaster. And this is something that we need to avoid. We don't want to do that. You see, Jesus Christ has given us a writ of emancipation. But there are some, old masters, if you will, you know, who see things quite differently and maintain that we are still slaves to this legal relationship with God. As opposed to a relationship with him that is based on Christ's love and an expression of mercy to us and extended by grace. I, for one, am increasingly thankful for the grace that God has bestowed upon us and upon me in my life. I, I, I can sit here and name you a million instances. And most of it in retrospect because I didn't always see it when it was straight on. I'd rather we have to be willing to circle back. So what of this yoke of bondage that he's talking about? To get a grip on what Paul is, is on about here, let's actually look at what Peter said. Sometimes we, we look to Peter to clarify what Paul said. In this case, it's in Acts 15, verse 10. And he was talking to those who were trying to bring Gentiles under the law. 
What does he say in verse 10? Now, therefore, why do you test God? Ooh. Who are we testing? Why do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? pretty tough sometimes when we try to argue against the plain language. You see, the Jews themselves weren't able to justify themselves before God by way of the law. Why then the burdensome yoke in terms of the law being put on the Gentile believers of the day? And transfer that to where we are now and what we're doing, why would we add a yoke to ourselves? Especially in light of the admission made by Peter here that we just read where he notes that neither they nor their ancestors could be justified by the law. And not only that, but they fell, fell short of keeping it just as badly as anyone. See, it's important to keep in mind if we kind of find ourselves becoming a little bit too idealistic. I'm going to have a message on why idealism doesn't jive with Christian belief or Christian thought for that matter and in a future message. So stay tuned, kids. But Paul saw this legal relationship with Jesus Christ as a yoke of bondage. And he was doing his level best to get that message out. And it's because it's related to slavery as opposed to the liberty. And as Jim noted in his message a few weeks back, the, the Jewish teachers counted up 613 commandments to keep in the law of Moses. That's a lot. <laughs> uh, biblical scholar Morris said, even to remember them all was a burden, and to keep them bordered on the impossible. Small wonder that Paul referred to subjecting oneself to them all as entering into slavery. He's using his words wisely here and carefully and with purpose. We've only gone through Galatians 5.1. Let's look at 5 verse 2. Talking about the danger of em em embracing the law as a way to walk with God. Because that's how it gets presented to us. We have to be very careful and we don't put caveats on what it is that God is trying to do with us or wants to do with us. See, circumcision was one of the chief elements that set the Jews apart from many other people. I suppose it still is to some degree. So when it's necessity in terms of a relationship with God and salvation was brought into the light as no longer being required, it caused problems for some. But Paul got right to it. Understand that at the end of all of this, you know, this was seen as a, a, a done deal. This was already dealt with. So why, you know, thousands of years later, we're still digging this stuff up? I think if Paul was standing here right now, he'd be like, what? Really? Didn't Pete and I get this over on y'all? Hmm. But he does get right to it. Verse 2 says, Take note, I, Paul, am telling you that if you get yourself circumcised, Christ will, pro will not benefit you at all. It will pro Christ will profit you nothing. See, if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. What's he saying there? 
He's saying that when we embrace the law as our rule of walking with God, or for walking with God, something's got to give on the other side of that. And what it means is that we have to relinquish or let go of Jesus. I shouldn't have to tell you that that's a bad move. It's a tough move. And it's a tough spot to put ourselves in or to allow ourselves to be placed in. See, when we attempt going the legal route with Jesus, he no longer is our righteousness. And what are we supposed to be seeking? Matthew 6.33. Seek you first the righteousness of God. And these things will be added to you, so on and so on and so on. But when we attempt the legal route, well, that whole Jesus as our righteousness thing kind of goes out the window, doesn't it? Because we've elevated the law to a place that it doesn't belong. And instead of turning to Jesus Christ in faith, we attempt to earn our relationship on our own. And I think that serves to really diminish the gift that is our salvation, the gift that is our ability to come in repentance and come under grace in this new covenant with our God. We want to glorify and elevate Jesus Christ and all aspects of him. We do not want to diminish it in any respect. Especially by putting it on our own responsibility and our own abilities to do so. See, as for the believers at Galatia who weren't Jewish to begin with, for them to receive this circumcision, you know, with, with this in mind, uh, you know, as a ritual that would show to God and everyone that this Gentile believer was coming under the law, well, folks, that would mean that they were no longer trusting in Jesus and his power to justify, forgive, and set free. And they put their trusts, it would mean putting their trust somewhere else. God doesn't will it that way. He doesn't want our trust to go anywhere else. And Paul could see the serious nature of what was going on. And it's no less serious in nature today. And it was so serious that Paul said confidently that to head back down that road would result in Christ profiting nothing. There's a sadness and an emptiness there that just doesn't jive, brother, that we, that we can't have a part of. Verse 3, he amplifies what he says. He says, I, again, I testify to every man who gets himself circumcised that he is obligated to do the entire law. And what he's talking about here is our inability to pick and choose. When it comes to Embracing this part of the law or that. And he, he's pretty emphatic here that if we embrace the law as our rule or our standard for walking with God, well, then we would have to embrace the entire law. As Jim, again, uh, thanks to Jim for bringing this stuff up. How would we even go about that in, in this day and age? Do we need to only wear one type of fabric when we go out? Do we have to put a blue strand in our threading or on our belts so that God will recognize us? I thought we were recognized by our faith in him 
through repentance. And I thought others would know that we were part of him when we act like Jesus Christ. When we copy him, when we do as he did, when we have faith, and, they, and when folks see our love one to another, then they'll know that we are of him. These are the elements of grace the, that we're needing to aspire to, folks. We can't pick and choose. <coughs> Excuse me. You see, if we go after this idea of embracing the whole law, then all of a sudden we make debtors of ourselves. A debt that Jesus Christ came to pay. How dare we? Because not only is that a huge debt, but it flies in the face of what Jesus came to do with that debt in the first place, folks. Now hopefully we can all agree that our debt, which is essentially, you know, death, we'd have to pay that out, death, it's our life. Well, that it's, it's been purchased and cleared by the blood of our Savior. <coughs> Forgive me. It's very dry here, folks. See, it's kind of central to what makes him our savior in the first place, isn't it? Paul was telling them, and so was Peter in Acts 15, that when we choose to walk by the law, we got to walk by the whole law. And if we come to God on the basis of our own law keeping, then we must keep the whole law, and our law keeping would have to be perfect, wouldn't it? It's all or nothing. There's no room for grace, and there's barely room for mercy. And isn't that why Peter said there in Acts 15, we and our fathers could scarcely live up to this. See, no amount of obedience can make up for one act of disobedience. As I said, it really is an all-or-nothing proposition. And Paul was showing that Jesus was the power and was the liberty and freedom and righteousness needed to freely walk and have a relationship with the Father. It comes through a relationship with him. And Paul spoke to the Gentile Christians that were among those Galatians who were being drawn into this whole thing of circumcision as an adult. And they wanted them to do it so that there was this evidence that they had come under the law of Moses and were setting it out as a first step to salvation. Ask yourself again, why do you think Paul had a problem with this? This is exactly where the problem lies, brethren. You know, we'll see in the last verse here that we read today in Galatians 5, uh, verse 6, that Paul didn't care one way or another about the physical act of circumcision. It wasn't that. What he detested was that it was be, being made a theology presented by legalists that was being made a requirement before one could go on the road to salvation. If you're going to be saved with us, you're going to have to do this. And unfortunately, brethren, that way of thinking has permeated through millennia. Paul was trying to set that aside then. And we need to take our cues from that. See, the first step to salvation comes from repentance. It comes in the form of repentance. And an appeal to Jesus in acceptance of him as God's personally sent 
Savior for us. And I think this stuff really bothered Paul. And we should afford it the attention that it deserves. Because quite frankly, brethren, to move otherwise should really bother us too. Paul didn't want anyone to needlessly lose out on anything in terms of salvation any more than God would want us to. It's a brand of love not often seen, but Paul really had it in his heart for the believers that he was preaching and writing to. And he had no idea of the effect that he would have going forward to some guy out in the middle of the prairies a couple thousand years later. But this should, uh, this should sit on us and weigh on us when we, we think of going counter to what Paul is telling us and what Jesus Christ is telling us about what it means to come into the liberty and the love. Because similarly to liberty, the liberty that we're talking about here and is the same as the love in that it's not just any love. This is the love of Jesus Christ and the liberty of Jesus Christ. As we said, to keep us from having to earn our way to God, which we couldn't do. We simply cannot do. In verse 4, it says, You who are trying to be justified by the law are alienated from Christ. And you have fallen out of grace. You cannot replace Jesus. Full stop. When we embrace the law as our rule of walking with God, we begin a separation that brings us to a complete departing from Jesus Christ and that grace. And the danger of that happening is very real, but it doesn't have to happen. It doesn't have to happen. See, falling away isn't just talking about immoral conduct or poor behavior in light of Scripture. Those are all elements of falling away for sure. But that's not what Paul had in mind here. You see, we're saved by our continued reliance and faith in Jesus Christ. And it's by the grace of God that we have been afforded this ability to come in repentance and take on that grace as how we live. This is very serious. When Paul is talking about falling out of grace, he's talking about falling into legalism and the dangers there. I like to quote David Guzik now and again. He said, by choosing legalism, we choose to relinquish grace as the principle by which one desires to be related to God. I think that's a pretty darn good way of putting it. I hope you agree, brethren. Because he literally says, Paul is literally saying, you have fallen out of grace. Not, it's not the same as falling from grace. I'm not going to get into all of the semantics of that at this time. But understand that there is a difference. It means you have chosen not to come under the better covenant that Jesus has set before you. 
A bit different, as I said, from the term falling from grace. So let's look at these last two verses here. Galatians 5, verses 5 and 6. It says, For we eagerly await through the Spirit, by faith, the hope of His righteousness. As the young folks would say these days, goals. Those are goals, brethren. Verse 6, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision accomplishes anything. What matters is faith working through love. Faith working through love. See, walking in the Spirit means waiting for righteousness by faith, not trying to earn it. You see, no one becomes a legalist through the Spirit, folks. It just doesn't happen that way. What matters is the faith working through love. So, with that, I've gone on long enough again today. Hopefully, we can draw the distinctions that we need to and afford ourselves the best possible relationship we can have with Jesus Christ, which is through faith, brethren. And through, literally, liberty and whole, and love for all. So with that, I want to wish you a happy Sabbath. Thank you again for joining us here today. Go ahead and subscribe if you haven't already. Hit that bell icon so you'll get a notification when these new messages go up. Tell a friend, tell an enemy. We love you. We love hearing from you. So go ahead and drop us a line if you will. Happy Sabbath. God willing, we'll see you here next time on Shepherd's Voice magazine.